If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Smoking, when did you first become interested in aviation? Well, I mean, I, I think most people my age probably remember this film called Top Gun uh, that came out in about 1986, saw it in the movie theater, and uh, from then on was kind of hooked, I guess. And what year did you actually join the Navy? So that's a good question. You know, I, for the longest time, I had applied to the service academies, and I don't know those folks in the uh, abroad, but there's three service academies, Air Force, Navy, West Point for Army. And I actually applied to West Point and, and was going to West Point up until uh, December of uh, 92, my senior year in high school. Well, I went to go visit West Point and it was a, I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but upstate New York in December is gray and cloudy. Uh, they had just lost the football game to Navy. Everybody was having to take finals. And I thought, oh man, I don't, I don't know about this place. And so then I, I went and visited uh, Annapolis in the spring, and it was very sunny, and sailboats were uh, going around the, the bay. Um, everybody was happy. They were playing volleyball, kind of like in the movie, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go here, and so I joined uh, the Navy through the Service Academy, Naval Academy, in 92. Uh, nice one. And did you always want to be a Rio or a Wizzo? Maybe it's a term this day, but uh, or did you want to go to pilot uh, training? Well, I really wanted to be pilot, but when I went down for my physical, the lady made me take my vision test, and I tried to do it without glasses, and uh, I was reading the chart, and she said, honey, do you drive without glasses? And I said, no. <laughs> she goes, well, you probably should be wearing glasses all the time. So, <laughs> so at that time, my next best option was to be a navigator NFO, um, and then selected you know, for F-14s after that. Yeah, so we're going to get into the F-14 here, a beautiful aircraft, obviously. But uh, what were your first thoughts on the Tomcat? You know, when you first see the Tomcat, it is really massive. And I think that uh, the thing that stands out to you is how can this airplane be so big? They, you know, they <laughs> call it the tennis court yeah. and still be nimble uh, and flexible. And so when you see it. Uh, and you stand on top of it, if you've ever had a chance to stand on top of it, it's just huge, uh, particularly for a fighter. Most fighters are pretty small, um, F-16 as an example. But but the Tomcat's different. It's it's what we call it the big fighter. Let's talk about your ground training and flying training in the F-14. And were you separate from the pilot? That's a good question. So when you show up to the RAG, and that's the, the Fleet Replacement Squadron uh, at VF-101 at that time, it was uh, the only RAG at that time, your first time you ever meet really kind of a pilot is at the F-14 RAG. Before that, during right. primary flight training and intermediate flight training, you were doing basically NFO work. But that's really the cool part uh, when you show up and the pilots have been doing their training and, and you've been doing your training as an NFO. And it's the first time you're working as a team. And so you go through the ground school for the F-14 Tomcat along with the simulators. And then you start working on your flights uh, to get basically essentially graduate level in the F-14 to go off to an operational squadron. Now, you're never paired up with another student pilot. You're always paired up right. with a uh, instructor pilot. But the two of you will be paired up in a uh, section, two aircraft. So the student pilot in one and the student Rio in the other, along with two student, or excuse me, two instructors. And so uh, that's where you do all your training for the F-14. And it really builds what I would say camaraderie on that two-person level, that teamwork, because uh, that's what was key about the Tomcat. It wasn't new. It was old technology. So... Well, the pilots had to do certain things and the and the Rios had to do certain things. And to make the jet uh, capable was both of those folks working together. 
And uh, I've heard this a few times from backseaters. Uh, are you the clever guys in the back? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we call the pilots the stick monkeys. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they just they just kind of tell you, you know, they can just kind of move the stick wherever they need to go. You know, both both guys are always phenomenal and gals. We had a, we had a few uh, women. Uh, phenomenal. Um, you, you've got to know each other's, you know, at least a little bit about each other's cockpit. And that really lends itself to making the jet more capable, uh, more, you know, lethal, if you will. Um, so so while the NFOs are, you know, maybe sometimes kind of nerdy, uh, there's a few <laughs> nerdy pilots out there, too. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, can you tell us about your first squadron? I'm guessing it was a, uh, an air squadron, F-14 Air? Yeah, at that time, we still had uh, A squadrons, B squadrons and D squadrons. And when you go through the RAG, uh, you are kind of separated off into A and B and then the right. D. Because the D Tomcat was a super Tomcat. It was a little bit different uh, from the radar perspective. So the D guys kind of already knew they had about three or four squadrons they were going to go to. My first squadron was VF-154, the Black Knights, which mm. at that time, uh, the Black Knights were stationed on the Kitty Hawk, which was forward deployed in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I was one of uh, several folks that went out to Japan and spent uh, three years forward deployed at what's called Atsugi, which is just near south of Tokyo. The airfield is uh, Atsugi Naval Air Facility, Japan. Wow. And, like, obviously going through that, like, you know, your ground training and stuff like that, did you get a choice of the A, B, or D? <laughs> no. No, as, right. a, as a new, new instructor, or excuse me, as a new a uh, pilot or a new NFO, you kind of get put where they tell you. Um, oh, okay. There wasn't wasn't much choice. Uh, kind of went kicking and screaming to Japan, but ended up really enjoying it uh, over the three years there. And look back on it fondly at this point. Um, and you know, the, the neat thing about the F-14A uh, at, at, at that time in Japan is they were fully equipped. So they had everything that you wanted. They had a lantern, um, they had all of the other bells and whistles that an F-14A could have because they were forward deployed. Squadrons back stateside uh, would have to turn their equipment in after deployment, and then they would uh, you know, work towards getting the equipment back towards their next deployment. But, but in Japan, uh, fully kitted out for everything uh, with the F-14A. Can you tell us a bit about the strengths and weaknesses of the A model, especially in your cockpit? That's a good question. You know, probably one of the of the better strengths is just the fact that it had the lantern pod on it with a nice P TID. And a P TID, for those that don't know, is a nice flat multifunctional display screen. That would was very nice because it was very clear, had good clarity. Uh, you also had a thing called FTS, which was a, a system where you could take a picture or pictures of the uh, targets and then fax it back to the ship. And so that made the 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 Air F-14A, which is typically a fighter, also become a pretty good bomber uh, later on yeah. in its life with uh, laser guided bombs. Now, uh, flip that over to the to the B and the D version. They had GPS capability, and when you have GPS, that allows you to drop precision uh, guided munitions like JDAM. And so late late in the life. Of, I believe the B and the D, I'm pretty confident the D had it, uh, was the, the ability to drop JDAM. And that made a, a big difference. Uh, and so that's probably a, a big advantage for the for the D and the B, is just the GPS uh, capability. And when you were going through your training, so like you were going to the A, like, and the, obviously there was a B and D there, uh, was there much competition between like Rio's and like, oh yeah, I'm going to the D, I'm going to the better one in courts? Or was that not there in your time? You know, I think there was certainly a little bit of competition. What, one of the big things that you would run into is when you would go to do dissimilar training yeah. with another with another uh, group. And so, like, I remember going to fight uh, Marine F-18 Hornets. And the question they asked us was, are you guys with big motors or small motors? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and frankly, we were with small motors because the A had the TF-30. Uh, but they knew about the big motors with the, the GE 110s, and so they wanted to know which one we were. For our viewers, can you uh, talk us through the back uh, the back cockpit of the air? Because I know there was so many circuit breakers. Was it like 
was it really hard to get used to all you know all the systems and everything like that? <laughs> well, you know, you've probably seen the latest Top Gun movie where they show yes. all the circuit breakers, and that is true. Uh, but they were they were set up. The circuit breakers were set up in panels, and there was a what I would call almost a rubric where you would be able to figure out. You know, I'm going to pull circuit breaker one alpha three. Well, that's you know the first panel. That's row alpha. That's the third circuit mm -hmm. breaker over. Now you did have to be you know a little bit twisty. Somebody described it one time as being a seven year old girl with a broken arm to reach some of these <laughs> circuit breakers, but you got a little bit better. So that's kind of the that's kind of the behind you. Uh, in the cockpit. Now, in front of you, there's a couple of different things. The, 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 the radar itself. Aug nine was probably the biggest component on the F-14, uh, with a lot of power out. So you would start the, start the, uh, the F-14 up and and get the alignment going, start up the Aug nine, and then once airborne, if you wanted to test it out, uh, you'd probably try and find. At least we did. Uh, airliners trying to land at Narita in Tokyo. Oh, wow. Um, and we can find guys a pretty far way out. Uh, wow. I'm talking over 100 miles. And so that shows you the power out that the AUG-9 had uh, from an air-to-air -air standpoint. And so obviously you would have the AUG-9 and then the, the other component that made it an air-to-ground, uh, basically, bomber was the lantern pod. And so you would practice uh, running over different um, island chains south of Tokyo and doing different capture uh, uh, pictures of, of different targets that may be out there for uh, you to capture with the lantern. Um, so those were the two big things, the, the AUG-9 and the lantern on the cockpit. There's a whole lot of additional, I guess, systems within the F-14, uh, both the A and the B and the D. Things like an ALR-67, which is a radar war warning receiver, allows uh, you to know if someone's targeting you or not. Um, certainly radios, everything from normal standard UHF radios to secure radios, um, an ALE-39, which is a chaff and flare dispenser, mm -hmm. um, whole lot of capability that really rounds out the rest of it besides just being uh, an air-to-air -air and air-to-ground, also a little bit defensive too, if you will, from a fighter standpoint. And then, uh, Spoken, you transitioned to the D, what was that a massive upgrade from the air for you as a as a real wizard? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, I went to the RAG as an instructor, and at the RAG you have the A, B, and the D, at least at that time. So uh, I would say it was a bit of a transition, but at the end of the day, you got a little bit used to it once you flew it uh, in terms of the D. Now, I would tell you, I probably was not an uh, uh, a capable operational employer. Like I, I couldn't go over to Iraq and, and use the systems to the best of their ability because it would have taken me a little bit of time to get up to speed. But the D was a lot easier in some respects. I mean, you would just turn on uh, the GPS and it would automatically get an alignment and be ready to 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 fight. Uh, that was different than the A. There there be times where you're trying to get an alignment and it, using an inertial navigation system, which is 1970s 60s technology, and you'd have to try and redo it, and the alignment would be off, and uh, a little bit more challenging there. So so the D was a little bit newer uh, and had some newer systems that made it a little simpler. You know that's a good question. We did not uh i didn't do it specifically with uh, f-15 wizards but we did talk with uh you know f-18 wizards and the differences between okay. right. the, the the new f-18 and the and the f-14d um we did uh you know th there's a lot more capability in the f-18f uh than the d but primarily because it's just a newer aircraft in my mind um a lot more things to do with uh you know, uh, mids capability and some other uh, systems that really make it a lot smoother and easier, different radar. Um, and, and those types of things uh, really lend itself to, you know, you can see the differences. Where The best way to describe it is, you know, in the F-18F, you've probably got a button you push to get something to happen. In the F-14, particularly the A and maybe the D model, you've got a knob that you've got to turn a couple of different times uh, to make the same thing happen. Was there much banter uh, between you and the F-18 guys? Like, yeah, I'm better than you. you know, we, we're like, uh, you know, the classic F-14 and stuff like that. 
I think there's always been a rivalry between the Hornet and the Tomcat. I mean, yeah. since the beginning of time with uh, with the Hornet introduction into the fleet. You know, the, the Hornet's a very capable aircraft. Um, what I will tell you is, as a single-seat uh, aircraft, the, the capability really is dependent on how good the pilot is. So right. um, a, a senior pilot uh, is probably very, very capable, and um, a Nugget pilot probably struggles a little bit more. Uh, whereas in the Tomcat, you had two uh, sets of eyeballs, two brains, uh, two folks looking out, and, and that, I think, lent itself to being a great platform for things like forward air controlling uh, and doing other types of missions uh, that we talked about, like air to ground bombing, uh, lasing for a for a uh, another aircraft. Those kind of multitask environments. Yeah, absolutely. The the D. One time, I, I, I an F fourteen A Rio said this about when he first sat in a D. He goes, "You know what? If I look around long enough." Uh, there's probably a button that I want to push that'll get me to do what I want to do. <laughs> Praise. So, so, so the general layout of the cockpit was very similar, right. but a couple of things uh, were different. A lot bigger, um, what I would call upfront control display, which is right in front of your face. So there were a couple of different MFDs there. And with the multifunctional display, a lot of things, and this is true with the Hornet as well, are in sub-menus. So you would push a button to get to another menu on that multifunctional display to get to right. where you want to go. Whereas in the F-14A, you didn't have that many sub-menus. It really didn't have any menus. You had a rolling drum. Um, and if you can think of moving a knob and then um, something like a, uh, a rolling pin underneath a glass you know, window, you would roll that to the different selections. And then you would hit a, hit a small uh, button. Mm -hmm. So we're talking going from an analog type of cockpit to a digital cockpit with different multifunctional displays and, and more buttons versus knobs. Right. Um, one of our favorite subjects on the channel is DACT. So um, how did the F-14, and you can pick the model, like how did it fare against the, uh, you know, the F-15, F-16, F-18, you know, and, and et cetera? Yeah, a couple of good stories on that one. I think that the first time we fought against F-15, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Eagles, uh, F-15C models in Japan, uh, it was Japanese, right? And yeah, they yeah. knew we had the Phoenix. Uh, and so we would we would come at them and then uh, we would take a shot. And I'm not going to say what the range was, but it would be fairly far out. And then they would just run away. <laughs> so <laughs> they never they never came uh, to emerge. Oh, wow. um, you know, the the Hornet versus a Hornet, um, the F-14 uh, is good in terms of speed uh, and a lot of b ability to, you know, bring power on. The Hornet is really good at maneuverability at slow speeds. And that's true kind of all the way up and down the line. Mm -hmm. So the nose authority, pitch authority of, of the Tomcat always helped because those uh, horizontal and vertical stabs are so big you can get uh, some pitch authority. Uh, going there, but really with the ability to turn on a dime, the F-18 was probably uh, better. Um, and so, you know, in terms of a of a one v one fight, the goal is to never get there. You know, you want to shoot the guy before uh, he has the ability to get to you uh, in a visual arena, and then if you can, uh, you'd want to try and bleed uh, as much uh, airspeed out of the Hornet as you can to try and uh, maybe make it around the corner a little faster to take another shot. Well, a debrief is pretty standardized in that they go through, you know, certain uh, metrics. And, and one of the big things that helped, I think, from a two-person crew is you got two guys who can remember how the fight went. Yeah. Um, and so you try and, you know, remember certain things to start where you started and where you finished. Where was the sun angle? Uh, what heading were we going? What was the pass? Was it a left-to-left -left or a right-to-right -right pass? Um, and then when you finished, you try and remember where that happened. And at that point, you try and connect everything else between A and B. You know, what was the start, what was the finish, and try and finish uh, recreating the fight in the middle. The, uh, the debrief was always um, a, a great opportunity for folks to kind of see what went well and what didn't go well. Mm -hmm. And I think that the key to remember is it's about everybody getting better. So folks would always try and be very, um, I guess, upfront about what, 
goods they did and what mistakes they made. And was there any eagles in the debrief there? Uh, the eagle was not in the debrief the, the time I'm recollecting. So that would, you know, likely it would be at a at a big uh, event like a red flag or a green flag where you would go right. through a, a big event like that with, with the Air Force. Um, and certainly there's standards on how you would, you know, call out a shot. Um, they're probably replaying on a big video screen so everybody can see what happens. Um, so that's that's <clears throat> your bigger events like a red flag. A type of event. Right, so we're going to get on to your time as their demo. You, you're obviously famous uh, for the last uh, F 14 <laughs> demo reel. So, how did this even come about, smoking? Well, you know, it started actually uh, in Japan. We were kind of unique in VF 154 in that we also would qualify a demo pilot to come out and do um, a, a demonstration for the air show out in Japan. Mm -hmm. That was typically the commanding officer. So at my time, my first one, I showed up, uh, Randy King, Gus King, and uh, Goat Boy Jim Bates were the pilot in Rio that were qualified to do the demo out in Japan. Uh, and so they certainly did all of the stuff for demo. And then it was... Uh, a gentleman named Seamus Flatley, Jim Flatley, who came out and uh, was our new XO, and he had a demo call, and I was his Rio. So we did an air show at uh, Misawa. We did one um, for the ship. Uh, we did one, uh, I believe, at uh, at base. Um, so that's where the first kind of demo uh, performances for me uh, happened. Um, and then I moved over to being a RAG instructor at VF 101, and went through a year or two there. We had a demo team, uh, senior guys who were doing it for air shows across the country. And then in 2004, uh, our commanding officer, Waldo Rolstad, he picked four guys to be on the demo team for VF 101 uh, for the 2004 season, which was uh, technically the last season. And was it like a, a privileged position to be the pilot and Rio Wizzo? Uh, was that like, a, I, I'm going to jump in, I'm going to put my name forward for that uh, uh, kind of role? Yeah, I think so. I, I would agree with that. You know, most guys uh, probably wanted to do the air show circuit if you could. Right. Now, it was likely single guys. Uh, you know, you're gone on yeah. the road for probably 30 weeks out of the year. Um, and, and that, you know, doesn't lend itself well to a shore duty <laughs> when you have kids. Um, so certainly those guys siphon themselves off, but surely we had uh, guys putting their name in the hat for it. And, and, um, you know, what, it was, it was certainly a, a desirable job. So how does the, the demo routine come about? Is it you and your pilot or is it the Navy saying we want this, we want that? How does it work? Yeah. So the, the flying portion of itself is determined by a, an instruction that is handled by the, the air wing, the Commodore. They have a set instruction manual that shows you what the maneuvers are, in right. what order they are, all of those types of metrics, if you will. And typically the way we did it was the demo team the year prior would give you uh, instruction on how to do the demo for the, for that year. So it starts off with just like anything, you probably do some simulators, uh, you get a kind of qualification in some simulators, and then you would go out to uh, a local area. We used what was called Dare County, and that was a bombing range, but it was essentially a, an open airspace to do, to do the demo. And you would do a practice, uh, probably with either a, a, a previous guy uh, he would go through the maneuvers and show, and then, you know, it would be the, the new guy who would do it. And then it would be uh, observed by an individual in a T-34, which is a small mm -hmm. uh, turboprop plane going around. So you'd do a, several different uh, practices at Dare County, and then you would come to the airfield, and that's where you would do kind of a qualification show with the commanding officer watching, and then he would give you the thumbs up. Um, to be clear, you know, if you practiced enough, in the, and most of the pilots are fantastic with the RAG, but practice enough in the simulator. You've done well at Dare County. Once you get to the qualification at uh, the air show itself, uh, at the at the field itself, uh, it's you know should be good. 
So what was the role of uh, Rio or Wizzo uh, in the 14 display? Best seat in the house is the, <laughs> the best way to describe it. Uh, you know, you, you're really a backup co-pilot. Um, one of the key things from a demo standpoint is getting where show center is. Uh, sometimes it can be easy because the Blue Angels are parked out on the flight line and you can say, hey, that's kind of show center. Other times it's pretty difficult. I remember we did one uh, in uh, off the coast of New Jersey in um, Atlantic City. And of all things, the Trump Hotel was show center. Uh, nice. We, we, could, we couldn't find the Trump Hotel, but we, we spotted it um, uh, to, to really get uh, started. And, and show center is really kind of where everything starts from. It's your, your anchor point for the show. Uh, when you're into the show, you're really calling out airspeeds and altitudes as the Rio. You're making sure, hey, the new, uh, the next maneuver is, um, you know, such and such. Uh, you're really a safety observer as well, making sure that you're at the right altitude. Um, air shows take place at 200 feet above the ground level. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it really challenging, both from a, a pilot standpoint, to, to make sure that you've, uh, you've, you've hit your numbers and you're not going to go below those numbers because if you do, you don't have a lot of time to correct. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like, air shows are a big thing. Uh, did you get people at the fence, you know, like, you know, fans who were like, I want to talk to you and stuff like that? Did you get that in your um, your your time as a demo reel? I think that's part of the job. You're there because you're a representative of the Navy and certainly Naval Aviation and the F-14 community. Your goal is to get folks interested in it, whether you're a seven-year-old uh, kid who's yeah. first time he's ever been in an air show or a, uh, an old guy who has been in the Navy or, you know, had a relationship with the Navy at some point. You're an ambassador for the Navy. And so that was probably one of the best parts, uh, getting to meet folks, talk to them. Everybody's got a story. Uh, you want to listen to what they've got to say. They've got a lot of questions, um, but it's a lot of fun too, uh, because you're showing off the, the jet. And, um, you know, to be clear, it, it's something that nearly every one of the guys at the RAG could have done. Uh, it's it's part of just, you know, our training and the way naval aviation works makes it so that uh, you could replace somebody and, and make them a demo pilot as well. So. And did you feel like, um, like when I see like uh, people like yourself, Navs, Wizzles, uh, Rios, did you feel like it was a privileged position? You're like, oh, people want to actually talk to me. Did you feel like that uh, going through? Well, you're trying to not let it go to your head, certainly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I still have folks reach out to uh, today that, uh, that you know, will have questions or, or want to talk about it. Um, it was a fantastic, you know, time of uh, my life and getting to basically do something that not many people get to do. Yeah. Um, probably one of the best things is you've got friends and family that come to watch the air show. Uh, and so yeah, getting to do cool. that, you know, folks don't understand what you do. They don't yeah. see, they don't, they don't fly up there with you, but when they're on the ground and they can see the jet go by, it kind of puts a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, credence into it is probably what I would say. So it was a, it was definitely a privileged position. You know, it was so privileged that we had, um, two guys from our team, uh, Opie Wally and Linus Schwartz uh, both went on to be Blue Angels after wow. their time in the Tomcat demo team. So that's awesome. And uh, do you remember your first air show and your first display? First air show. Let's see. I think I think it was the Fort Lauderdale Air Show in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. If I'm not mistaken, um, what? was really stands out is they have when you do an air show an air show over water and, and every air show has what i call a performance box right uh mm -hmm. they've got a box and it's a it's just a drawn out box on a map or chart from the faa but when you go over water the coast guard has kind of lined out buoys and they've got mm -hmm. patrols on uh, for boats so boats can't go into the box well in fort lauderdale when you get airborne, 
um, you take off from from Fort Lauderdale International and go straight a little bit north along the shoreline. All of a sudden, the box is directly below you and depicted because everybody's got their boat anchored right up to the edge. Of it. <laughs> and so there must have been I couldn't tell you, Mike, there must have been five, ten thousand boats out there um, all kind of magically in a rectangle around yeah. uh, in a, you know around the box air show box and then certainly uh, uh, you know a couple of 50 100,000 folks on the beach watching at Fort Lauderdale the thing to remember is maybe behind the thunderbirds and the blue angels at that time the tomcat was the premier air yeah, show was, yeah yeah uh, and people wanted to see it you know f16's got a great demo F-15's got a great demo, but we, those are kind of, we'll get a lot of those airplanes. We don't have many Tomcats, and Tomcats yeah. were very unique. Uh, they were big, they were loud, they were super fast. Um, when you get to do that in front of a couple hundred thousand people, uh, it's an awesome feeling. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. You know, Chicago Air Show is a fantastic air show. If everybody's anybody's ever had a chance to go to Chicago in the summer, it's particularly uh, great weather, fantastic time over Lake Michigan. Um, they do the ra- they do the show and they broadcast it over local TV and radio. Oh, well, wow. one of the things that we would always do is the Rio would talk to the crowd, and so uh, <laughs> my then girlfriend, now wife, was at the Chicago Air Show with her friend, and so I got to talk to them over the radio with 200,000 other folks listening. So that's always what was really cool about it is the, the, the ability to kind of do those types of things to, to not only show off, but, you know, make a, a kind of a personal touch. So Japan in particular is Tomcat crazy. And so the air show right. there was uh, a unique experience because they would open the gates up at seven and by seven ten there would be, hundreds of guys running with probably $50,000 worth of camera equipment wow. to, get, to get right in the middle. Um, and our air show booth that we had in Japan would probably, you know, uh, sell uh, 10,000 10, items to local Japanese folks with uh, folks wanting autographs, all that stuff. And so in Japan, it was it was really uh, uh, an F-14 kind of centric type of crowd. Well, stateside, certainly the same thing as well. We would always be in the booth signing autographs. Uh, folks would want to come up and talk about the jet. Uh, we would sign kids' hats. All that That's kind awesome. of stuff is, you know, the same thing that the Blue Angels do, but we were a little bit different in that we're, we're only a two-person crew uh, or maybe four-person crew if both of the crews went to the show versus uh, eight Blue Angels. So um, it was certainly a, a fun part of the experience getting a – talk to the crowd and handshakes and pictures and all that good stuff. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, but can you share maybe a couple of memorable stories? I'm sure you have many, but uh, from your time on the F-14 demo team. So Chicago was a great uh, air show, which we talked about. And one of the cool things I remember is the show takes place just north of the city at uh, the Navy Pier. If, uh, if folks can kind of envision a really large set of buildings kind of right behind you. And I remember vividly one time we were doing, I believe the, probably the, the, the dirty, the, the uh, dirty double Immelman, which is essentially yeah, where yeah. You go up on yeah. your back. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. Um, and uh, I look over to my left and there's a Southwest airlines jet. That's, you know, a couple of miles away, definitely out of the box, but he's going the opposite way. Mm-hmm. And we, <laughs> we are upside down on our back. And then you look behind you and you can see the John Hancock building uh, kind of oh, right wow. in your, your your field of view. So uh, the the ability to do those things, you know, basically be um, crazy, if you will, in a controlled manner, you don't get to do that. I mean, folks just don't get to, to fly around buildings like that anymore in a controlled manner. You, you got to have special permission. So that is probably uh, one of the unique things I remember is just looking at Chicago and seeing everything both from an upside down perspective and a right side up perspective. That was a, a ton of fun. Um, and then the other one that I think is probably uh, unique and, and fun was being able to perform in front of your friends and family. Uh, each one of the, the demo guys got to pick a home show. And so I right. think Linus picked Topeka, Kansas. 
Um, Opie picked uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Rhode Island, I think, was for Rocco. And then mine was Dallas. And so, you know, you've got probably 15 or 20 family members coming out to watch you uh, whenever you you perform. And then, you know, the taxi back, you try and look for your family and wave at them in the crowd. That certainly was a, a fun time. And then probably the most memorable one of all was the last demo ever. And mm -hmm. folks don't may, may not remember this, but, you know, you had the 2004 air show season, which was a full season with the F-14. And then we took a break. We didn't do anything because the F-14 was going away. So there was no single plane demo except for the final air show at Oceana. And that was mm -hmm. in September of 2005. And so um, Buckus Haas, who is a fantastic CEO of the F-14 RAG at that time, said, hey, we want to do one more last show for the Tomcat. And so Rocco and I were the really the only guys uh, around that could still do it. We went back and did a couple of simulators. Uh, we got qualified. Um, a guy, a friend of ours named Cheese Lindbergh, watched us in the T-34. Then we did a qual show at the at the uh, field with uh, Butkus. And then we did basically a weekend in September, three days of uh, F-14 single-plane demo. Nice. Um, and, uh, and one thing unique about that, I remember when you, you come by for the high-speed pass, you don't want to break mock, right? It's really easy yeah. to break mock yeah. in the in the B or the D. And so that number's like 1.0, 1.01. Um, parts of the, sh the, sh the jet may be what I call in a transonic stage. So it's not, it's not, you know, past the mock number, it's close. So Rocco, <laughs> Rocco decided he was going to push it as fast as he could. And so I'm calling out the number as we come by the crowd, 0 0.94, 0 0.95, 0 0.9. I think I said 0.98, and I made some inflection. Ooh, God, on that's 0.98, <laughs> and we passed probably going 0 0.98, 0 0.99, wow. right by the crowd. Um, I remember Buckus before the before the show said, "Hey, let's make it the best show ever, but let's don't get in trouble." So, <laughs> so we did that. We accomplished it, and then we landed, and um, and that was both Rocco and mine uh, last F-14 flight ever. But uh, how many hours did you get on the F-14 smoking? So I was probably one of the last guys to get over a thousand hours in the jet. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's kind of your journeyman number. Um, you know, folks get two thousand, even three thousand, uh, but a thousand hours is kind of where you wanted to be in terms of a journeyman uh, overall. So I've got a, a overall more than two thousand hours in, in fighters, but only a thousand, maybe twelve hundred or so in the Tomcat. I think you went on to the F eighteen, if I'm correct, saying that. I had a unique career, uh, moved over to the F-18 as an instructor at Miramar, which was Marine Corps at that time. Nice. So I'm probably one of the few Wizzo Rios that's flown F-14A, B, D, and F-18, B, D, and F. And how did you find that like, transition going to from the Tomcat to the Hornet? You know, for some people, it's probably not that hard. For me, it was hard. Trying to nice. teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the The hard part is you just you really got to dive into it and just start, uh, you know, being operationally fluent with everything. It's a great system. F eighteen F, particularly with uh, APG seventy nine, is a phenomenal uh, airplane, and uh, I think it really is a, a leap forward from the Tomcat just in terms of capability. Now, in terms of coolness factor, certainly not. Uh, oh, it's a step definitely. back, maybe, but but with the <laughs> with the F eighteen uh, F, it's it's a fantastic platform that you know you you got to get proficient and, and use the systems to to be good. And when you went from the Tomcat to the Hornet, were you a bit dogmatic in terms of how you thought about the systems and stuff like that? A little bit, but you know you you got to accept. Uh, and I was with the Marines too, so the Marines, you know, they they're they're a little different. Uh, in some respects as well. Uh, but, it, you know, after you get used to it, it gets a lot better, and you tend to accept the, the goods and certainly kind of, you know, shove off the bads, if you will. We, me and Smoke can chat just be, uh, briefly beforehand, but you've had a trip in a tornado, haven't you? I got one flight in the tornado. This was at RAF Lucas. The unique thing about the Tomcat was... 
I don't know if it's unique, but, but we had two guys every year who would come uh, over from um, Great Britain, and they were aviators, and they would cross train, and then become yeah. instructors uh, <laughs> in the F-14 Tomcat. Um, and so, one of the paybacks for that was they would bring a group of us back over to a tour of uh, Great Britain. And so the choices were either go play golf at St. Andrews for a, for a day <laughs> or go in a tornado. Uh, I raised my hand and said, you know, I can come back and play in St. Andrews yeah, anytime, that. but you only get one chance to do a flight in a tornado. Uh, we took off uh, over the golf course. You could see it, uh, both the old and the new course. It was phenomenal. We did a bunch of, um, uh, I guess it was kind of a 1v1 out in the over the ocean. Wow. Uh, I think we even spotted a whale, maybe, and the fourth, nice. uh, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but it was fantastic. It was really hard to understand what people were saying because oh, over really? the radio with accents, you're like, oh, my gosh, what did they just say? Uh, but it was a unique and fun experience. So... As a, like an F-14 Rio in, in the back, uh, like how did you find the back cockpit of uh, Tony the F-3? We were like, oh God, this is old fashioned or how do you find it? <laughs> uh, gosh, I'm trying to be honest. Back. That's been 20 <laughs> years and I only had one in point two hours in it. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was probably similar to an F-14D uh, in terms of its newness. Uh, I remember a couple of different joysticks um, certainly a, a few more push tiles for a multifunctional display than, than knobs. Um, when, I can't even recall, how old's Tornado? Was it uh, mid-80s? Yeah, or? late uh, 80s kind of thing. The F3 came in, like maybe 86, 87. Yeah, so similar similar to the D in terms of, you know, what it looks like in terms of how, um, what era it's from. Um, certainly got, you know, swing wing, uh, which is cool. Um, and, so uh, it, it was fun, a fun experience. I, I, I can't recall more than that though. It's been a while. Did you go, uh, did you get to go supersonic wings back kind of thing over the North Sea? Yes. Yes. That I believe cool. so. Yeah. That, so I've been supersonic in a couple of different aircraft. Um, and one of them's tornado, one of them's a F 18 D and then certainly the Tomcat. We're going to wrap up with some personal questions here, Smokin. So do you have any hobbies? Do I have any hobbies? Uh, you know, I, I, most of my time is probably taken up watching kids do things, whether it be sports <laughs> that they're involved in. So those are those are my first hobbies. I still try and do some weightlifting and exercising um, and, uh, you know, uh, occasionally play golf. Nice stuff. Favorite aircraft you've flown? Oh. That's an easy one, Mike. It's the F-14. I would probably say the F-14A would be my favorite nice. because it was the one I was the most proficient in. When I left VF-154, I, I felt like I was a pretty good uh, air crew member. Great stuff. One you would like to fly either past or present? Oh, so that's a good one. It would it would either come down to the F-35 or F-22 in terms oh, wow. of... Okay. Um, one of those. I mean, I think F-35 would be pretty, pretty awesome to look at. So, so from a forward looking perspective, I'll give it to the, the joint strike fighter. Um, in past, probably the P-51 Mustang or, um, nice. I mean, I'd love to take a ride in like the B-29, like Doc. There's only two of those out there, right? So, um, that'd be, that'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, Smokin, can we find you online anywhere? We are uh, on the Instagram at F14 Tomcat Demo. Um, fantastic channel there. So if you're a Tomcat fan, we kind of focus on the Tomcat and come join us. We've got a lot of followers and it's a fun time. Awesome stuff. Well, Smokin, thank you very much for coming on the channel. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'll link everything uh, below, like where you can find Smokin. But uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great, mate. Thank you very much. Hey, um, thank you, Mike. It's been awesome. Nice job with the air crew interview. Good uh, stuff. Cheers.